Revelation chapter 4, if you'll go there please, I'm going to read a few verses, we'll start at verse number 8 and uh, get into the Word of God tonight. The Bible says, Revelation chapter 4, 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come, and when those And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, cast the crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and notice this, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I want to tell you that uh, we live in a society today that's backwards. Everything's backwards. Uh, we, we've got, I mean, I mean, it's just, it's a mess. There's so many examples I could give, but you, you and I both agree that the world is backwards. And I think some ways today that backwardsness has made its way into the church in that we like to think sometimes that God was created for our pleasure rather than we were created for God's pleasure. And I think that's where a lot of heresies spring up. I think that's where the health and wealth social gospel comes in. We think God is some big cosmic vending machine in the sky who if we uh, put a little quarter in, he just pours cosmic goodies all over us and we just enjoy ourselves. And and God is just some genie in the bottle. He's there to grant all of our wishes and make our dreams come true. And that's not who God is. The Bible says at the very end of verse number 11, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and we're created. And I want to talk to you about pleasing God tonight, if you would let me. Pleasing. The Bible says, verse number 11, For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I want you to know that we were created for God's pleasure, but we think that God was created for our pleasure And that's where much of our problems lie. I want to start off this sermon tonight by letting you know that there have been some people who lived in their entire existence as summed up by trying to please God in everything that they do. If you'll go back to the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, I want to give you an example of this. In Hebrews chapter 11, in verse number 5 is where I want to read. This is the great hall of faith and uh, the world has their hall of fame, but God has his hall of faith here in Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And by the way, that's one of the raptures in the Bible. There's seven of them, actually. And this is one of them. He was translated that he should not see death and was not, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he did what? He, say it with me, church, please God. Now listen, I want to tell you today that that's what life is all about. A lot of people spend their days trying to please themselves and trying to please this old tabernacle of flesh and they forget that there's a God in heaven that you ought to try to be pleasing to. We've got too many people today that, uh, I mean, they may be 40, 50, 60 years old, but they're like a toddler. It's all me, 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 my, my, my. I'm going to do what I want to do and if it feels good, I'm going to do it. And whatever pleases me, I'm just going to go off and live my life that way. What about God, sir? Did you please Him with your life? Did you please Him with your existence? Did you do anything that God wanted you to do? That's really what life is all about. I want you to know also that there are people in this world that uh, they live for nothing other than just to please themselves. And if you go with me to Romans chapter 1, I want to show you an example of this. Romans chapter 1 is the chapter that I call the road to hell. It all starts as when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. And I want to tell you that, that the first thing that happens when a person starts going down the road to hell is that they deny the very existence of God. And the, what is the very first thing they teach a public school kid when he goes into those public school centers? They teach him that you're a monkey from evolution, that there is no creator, and everything in the world, every, all, the, all the stars and the moon and the planets, everything's just some big gigantic accident. They are literally stripping the idea of God out of these little kids' minds, and it's no wonder they grow up to be little communists. That's what they're doing. We go to meet Romans chapter number 1, and I want you to see in uh, verse number, uh, let's just go here, verse number 29 says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, uh, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. Wow. 
people that when they say in God we trust on a coin, they, they just throw the coin in the trash or something crazy like that. When they see the Ten Commandments at the courthouse, they rally and try to have that removed from the courthouse. There is no reason for that other than you're just some God hater. That's the only reason you do that. It's not because you believe in religious liberty or separation church and state. You just, be, you just believe that God is a big, big jerk and you want Him eliminated from the world. And that's the only reason you do it because you're a hater of God. That's it. The Bible says that they're haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, and without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Look in verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have what? Pleasure in them that do them. Meaning this, these people are not only living lives of fornication and God-hating and backbiting, they're, 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 they're murderers, they're adulterers, they're, they're disobedient to parents, and they absolutely love every second of it. What a total crazy world we live in. But that's what, we, that's what it says right there. I want you to go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, just a few pages forward if you don't mind. And we find that God is very serious about sin. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, <clears throat> and it talks about how that, um, that these people, they would not receive the Lord Jesus. And it talks about there in verse number, uh, verse number 1 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we, see, we beseech you therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So he's speaking about prophecy here. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us. As that the day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except the coming of falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That right there is going to be your antichrist. And your Antichrist is going to be revealed sometime after the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. And uh, look what it says here, verse number 7. <clears throat> For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's your mystery of religion. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. And then that wicked shall be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's the Antichrist. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And it talks about the second coming of Jesus and all this right there. And it says right here... <clears throat> Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. I believe that there are people that you and I have witnessed to, that you and I, they've heard our sermons, they've heard the things that we had to say, and they said, maybe, they said, that's not for me, I don't believe that. And, and these are the same people that are going to follow the Antichrist during the seven year tribulation and be judged and be sent to hell at the battle of Megiddo and the very, very, the very final judgment. I believe the same crowd, because they rejected Christ and because they rejected the gospel, that these people are going to die and go to hell and look what it says right there, verse number 11. This is talking about the end times. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Meaning this, that, that it's, not, it's not the Antichrist deceiving them anymore. They have so rejected God and so rejected the Bible that the Bible says that God himself will send a delusion to them so that they will believe a lie. And if you don't think the world is ready of that, let me remind you about COVID in 2020. I walked to Shepherdsville Walmart on my phone, and I was wearing a bandana. You know, you got to wear the mask at the time. I was wearing a bandana, and I was on the phone, so I took my bandana down and walked into Walmart with, with my phone up like this, and they hired some rent-a-cop to stand out there to guard the thing, to guard the entrance from people who aren't compliant. And I, I had a 350-pound fat overweight rent-a-cop push me as I was walking into Walmart saying, Hey, you got to put a mask on. I didn't know what was happening. I about, he about had hands laid on him. Amen. <laughs> And I just went, I looked at him, and, and I, I was kind of shocked that he did that. I thought, this guy just pushed me. And I'm on the phone. I don't even know who I was talking to. And I looked at him, and he was dead serious. And so I put my mask over my nose. I walked in, grabbed a buggy, pulled the mask down, walked in, did my shopping. 
People were belligerent. People were weird. People were out of control. There were, there were public health officials at a federal level saying that if you refused a vaccine, you ought to die. It was wickedness. And you don't, you don't realize this, but uh, during that time, it was, it was me and my wife and family here. The, Pastor Jordan was here. I think Dave and Elizabeth were here. We were all singing. And the Kentucky State Troopers walked in this church building wanting to know what we were doing. I got it on film. That happened. That happened here. Yeah. And you just wait. You just wait. That same crowd that was doing all that is the same crowd who has rejected the gospel, who during the Antichrist reign on this earth are going to be the ones going door to door saying, if you don't have a mark, you're going to be thrown out of society. We don't want those markless people around here. Yeah. They're delusional. No Christian was doing that, by the way. You find that to be funny. I, 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 I don't, I, it was terrible. And it says in verse number 11, For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Look in verse number 12. The Bible says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had what? Had what? Pleasure in unrighteousness. That happened, friend. That happened. So there's some people that live out there that live to please themselves. Go also to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we find here the, another description of the end times heart of man. 2 Timothy 3 verse 4 says this, that people in the end days are going to be traitors, heady, high-minded, and then look at the next thing, lover of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. What a mess that is. Amen. You know how you get rich today? You sell pleasure. That's, that's how you get rich. If you want to make a lot of money, sell pleasure. Whatever, that, whatever form that takes, whether that takes form in a bottle or that takes form in some luxury vacation or that takes form in some, just sell pleasure and you'll make a lot of money because this is what the world is. I want you to go over to Philippians chapter 2 tonight with me. I think that's backwards a little bit. And I want you to notice that Christians ought not live like worldly people. Christians ought to have a completely different outlook on life. We ought to have a different philosophy of life. We ought to have a different conversation of life. Everything about us ought to be different. I think Christians ought to look different. I think Christians ought to act different. I think Christians ought to, quite frankly, I think Christians ought to smell different. Is everybody all right? Walked into Arby's and stood in the line trying to get me a sandwich, and dude in front of me smelled like marijuana. We were both hungry for different reasons. <laughs> I don't think Christian people ought to be like that. But I think when a Christian gets saved and starts to get spiritual and starts to get right with God and starts to grow in the Lord, I think their philosophy of changes away from what pleases me into what pleases God. I think that's really where it all hinges on that. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 13. Let's just go in verse number 12. Let's go there. Philippians 2, 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That verse right there does not mean that you need to find some sort of negotiating table and go to, like Donald Trump, negotiating some sort of contract. Lord, if I do this, 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 will you take me to heaven? I'll do this, this, this. You, you know, Lord, I, I want to I wanna go to heaven, but please let me keep my cigarettes. That's not what that means. I've met so many people who believe that verse and took that verse out of context. When it talks about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, that's talking about becoming a, becoming a greater Christian. That means, that means acting like more of a Christian, working out. You have a salvation inside of you and it ought to show on the outside a little bit too. You ought to work that out with fear and trembling. Verse 13, the Bible says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and and to do of his good what? I, I'm going to tell you right now. Is everybody all right? Y'all okay? Let me rewind the tape a little bit. Can I, can I, let's do verse number 13 again. Y'all ready? For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good what? Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, it's because of verses like this that I take major issue with guys like Joel Osteen. Every day is a Friday. Name of one of his books. Your best life now. Truth is, if you're living your best life that you're ever going to live right now, the truth is you're going to hell when you die. Yeah. 
because there's a greater life that we're going to live and you're not going to look like you look all, all this, you know, you're not going to look like that forever. Amen. There's a greater life and a better life. Some of you older people elbowed your husband when, when I said that. Amen. Uh, but uh, there's a greater life that's coming. And, and, and in the meantime, it's God that works in us both the will and the do of God's good pleasure. And, and I'm, I'm tired of hearing Christians uh, talk about the things that they want to do when it ought to be about the things that God wants me to do. What does God want you to do with your life? I was at, uh, I, I was, years ago I saw a flyer about a Christian school that was having a career day at the Christian school. What do you want to do when you get out of high school? What do you want to do when you grow up? Th those questions are, are foolish and unbiblical. Y'all not ask Christian kids, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? You want to be a fireman or a policeman or a doctor or a lawyer? What do you want to do? That's not, that's not how this works. That's not how the Christian life works. It ought not be about what do you want to do when you grow up. It ought to be what does God want you to do when you, when he, when you grow up? We ought not have career days at Christian schools. We ought to have the will of God days. And by the way, I'm worried to death. I'm not, I'm not seeing any more young men getting called to preach anymore. Something's wrong. Yeah. Something's wrong. I, I'm not seeing any more young families surrendered to the mission field anymore. Something's wrong. I just talked to Jerry Sexton this week, and he was talking about how when he traveled with his daddy years ago as a young man, he traveled with his daddy. He'd preach a, a week's meeting somewhere. And it was very common that a family, a solid family in the church would come forward and say, God's called us to Argentina or God's called us to Romania or God's called us to some foreign country. He said that was very common, happened almost every week. And I asked Jerry, I said, when's the last time you saw that in a church? He says, I can't even remember. You know why? Because we've, we've gotten so worldly in our thinking. We're so worried about what I'm going to do when I grow up. And kids are trained with that and ought not be that way. Most of the kids that I went to Bible college with that are now on the mission field, they were called to be missionaries and they were called to be preachers and they were called to be evangelists when they were less than 13 years old. And I wonder what the future looks like. We've got a poisonous philosophy amongst us and it ought not be so. When God works in you, it becomes less and less about what you want to do to please you. It becomes more and more about what God wants you to do that pleases him. And by the way, can I, can I tell you this? Uh, is everybody all right? I need a vote of confidence. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to start meddling here in a minute. Most of the time, most churches have a lot of problems because they, they hire a man who comes in trying to be the preacher and he's trying to find out what God wants the church to do. And the church is trying to find out what they want to do. Yeah. And it causes a conflict. And lots of times when a preacher steps up and says, this is what the Bible says you ought to do. I mean, like one of the hot button issues is like, you know, what should women wear and what should people dress like? And, and the preacher tries to get up and says, you know, women ought to be modest and men ought to be modest. And there ought to be a gender identity. There ought to be a gender distinction. You know, the first thing, the first objection to that is, but I like it. I like these clothes, and I like this music, and I like this internet. Well, does it please God? Yeah. That's the question. It ought not be, do I like this? Because who cares what you like? It's not about you. Revelation 4.11 says, for, for, because for, we were all created for God's pleasure and not for our own. Right. And a lot of people who live for themselves and live for their own pleasure, they end up being miserable. Yep. Thank you for letting me say that. I, that felt good to say that. I'm going to give you a couple of things tonight. I'll give you five points and then I'll be done. I'll, I'll, I might be done before eight o'clock. You guys will appreciate that. And, uh, and I, I hope that you slip me a $20 bill after church <laughs> for, uh, for being a blessing to you. Super Bowl's next week, so um, get your DVRs ready. And I'll be, I'll be out of the country, so I won't be here to judge you if you don't come Sunday night. But I'm going to give you five things tonight that please the Lord with your life that you can do. And I want you to go to, with me to Romans chapter number 8. Five things that will please God. And by the way, there's more than five. <laughs> there's a bunch of them. But I'm just going to give you five and then we're going to go. The first thing that a person can do that pleases God, number one, is to get saved. Do y'all hear me? Is to get saved. Amen. Romans chapter 8, and the Bible says in verse number 6, 
Uh, look what it says. Let's just go, that's verse number five. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. And that's talk, there's, there's flesh and spirit there. And by what it's talking about is, is spiritual people who are born again and carnal fleshly people who are not born again. Verse six says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God and it is not subject to the law of God and neither in, indeed can be so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you see that right there? And so the only way you can please God is to be in the spirit. And truth be told, there is, listen, listen, if you're unsaved and you're, you're not born again, there is nothing that you have done that has ever pleased the Lord. There is no walking ladies across the street. There is no good deeds. There is no magical scale in heaven where there's good and bad and you're for good outweighs you're bad, you're bad, you go to heaven. You're bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. There is nothing of the sort. If you are not saved, everything that you have done is sin. Everything that you have done is, uh, is wickedness. Everything that you have done with your life has not pleased God in any way, shape, or form. The only thing that pleases God is Jesus Christ. And at the baptism of Jesus Christ, they baptized him by immersion. And I don't believe, I saw a painting years ago with John the Baptist and Jesus got in the water and John the Baptist grabbed a big bowl and poured a bowl over Jesus' head. I don't think that's what the, that the Bible teaches at all. I think John the Baptist baptized Jesus by immersion. And when Jesus came up, there was a voice from heaven that came down and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the only way that a person can please God is if they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because only Jesus pleases God. And the only reason I'm going to heaven is not because I'm good. The only reason I'm going to heaven is because Jesus is good and Jesus is my Savior and Jesus is my Lord and I have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ upon my account and because of that, that is the only thing about me that pleases God. And if you're going to get to heaven, that's the only way you're going to please God either is through Jesus Christ by receiving Him as their Savior. And I'm, I, I, I look at this verse, verse Romans 8, 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And I think about the great white throne judgment. There's going to be people sitting there saying, but wait a minute, Lord, I wasn't a serial killer and I wasn't a child molester and I wasn't some drug dealer and I wasn't running a cartel. Lord. I paid my taxes, God. I did. I mean, I, I was, I, I, I remember one time I, I, I just, I did, I did these nice things. Oh God, what, what, was, what was so bad about me? You weren't saved. You were in your flesh. And they that are in their flesh cannot please God. And the only way a person can really please God is to trust Jesus Christ who did please God. I want to say number two, the second thing that a person can do to please the Lord is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The second thing that a Christian can do, a person can do to please God. Number two is to give the gospel to this lost and dying world. I want you to look, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 18. The Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. <laughs> I love that right there. Uh, it says, it goes on, verse number 20, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made, fo the, made foolish the wisdom of this world? Verse 21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks a uh, foolish but unto them which are called both Jews and Greece, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. I love that verse right there. It says there in the end of verse number 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And I want to tell you right now, churches today are getting away from preaching. Oh, we need preaching. Preaching pleases God. You know what? Preaching does something that no other activity of the church can do. I love singing and I love music and I, I'm for all that. But I'm going to tell you something. that God has ordained the preaching of the gospel to be the, to be the means of communication by which people will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And if we forsake preaching, then we're done with everything, friend. A lot of churches today putting on these cantatas and putting on these plays and putting on all these entertainment festivals and putting on all these little shows. They're, they're all garbage anyway. They're all like B minus productions. They're, they're terrible and boring. And the only reason people do them is because, because they like seeing the kids being cute. And that's all good and well. And I'm, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But we cannot sacrifice preaching on the altar of cute and festivals and cantatas and plays. We must be preaching and preaching must be the forefront of everything that we do. 
heard a preacher in Tennessee years ago. He said, bless the Lord. He said, if they're going to turn the lights on in that building, there's going to be preaching in that building. <laughs> he said, I don't care if women are having a, 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 a session on how to bake a cake. Somebody's going to be preaching in that building if the lights are turned on. And I think that's a good philosophy, don't you? Preaching. Preaching, reproving, and rebuking, and exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what we ought to be doing in the house of God. And if we're not preaching, then we are not pleasing the Lord, my dear friend. I, uh, I, I study this charismatic movement quite a lot. And I'm, some people call me an expert on it. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just a guy who knows it's a bunch of garbage, and I can tell you why. That's about all I view about all that. But I want to tell you something that happens in these charismatic services. They have some band get up and then they'll play a bunch of crazy music and then they'll have another band get up and give a bunch of crazy music and then they'll have a praise team get up give a bunch of crazy music and by the time about an hour passes, some little wiggly thing will get up and he'll give some non-confrontational smooth wiggly talk for 15 minutes and then they'll take an offering and then they'll all leave saying how much of a, a wonderful experience that was in the house of the Lord. If there wasn't preaching, they wasn't the house of God. And if it wasn't preaching, God wasn't pleased. And if there was no preaching, if there was no hardcore, leather lung, letter rip, fire breathing preaching in the house of God, then you mark it down, God was grieved that day. I like men to get up and preach. I'm sick to death of these beta male, effeminate, estrogen filled, wiggly things getting up, giving religious TED Talks in the house of God. I like missionaries who can preach. And I like evangelists that preach. And I like hearing preachers that preach and just let the fur fly, let the chips fall where they may. And, and many times I, I just, my, I just been, you know, my mind runs out of things to say and I just start making up things to preach against. Preach against the color of yellow one time. It was awesome. I preached against, I preached against those knit ties. You know those knit ties, the crochet ties that are like really skinny. I preached against those things. I said, that's a, that's a sock. You ought to put that on your foot. Put a real tie on your, on your neck. That's stupid. I mean, I, I just, I made up stuff, but I was preaching because I think preaching pleases God. And you know, let me tell you this. I, I believe you're all, everybody that you work with ought to know you're a Christian. I believe everybody you go to school with ought to know you're a Christian. I believe your neighbors ought to know you're a Christian. And, if, and the reason they don't, listen to me, the reason that they don't is because you're scared that you might create a situation in which you will be uncomfortable. Let me translate that for you. You're all about pleasing yourself. Is everybody all right? Number two thing is to, is to preach and give the gospel. Number three thing that will please God is to get away from sin. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Young, forget about that 8 o'clock. I feel pretty good right now. First Thessalonians chapter four, the verse number one says, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to do what? And to do what? Please God so that you abound more and more. And the whole chapter goes on, talks about how you ought to please God. Verse number three says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. And uh, I want to tell you right now that if you're living in sin, and if you're not living in sanctification, that you're not pleasing to God with your personal life. Absolutely. Verse number seven says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? Holiness, friend, and that's a scary word in a lot of churches. That's the boogeyman of, of the average church. People want, don't want to preach on holiness. People don't want to talk about that kind of stuff because that's legalism and you're just being a Pharisee. I mean, there was a big guy named Alistair Begg. How many know who Alistair Begg is? He's a big famous radio preacher. He gave some dumb counsel the other day. He said, if you've got a granddaughter who's getting married in a wedding, you ought to go to the wedding and buy them a gift and wish them well. And the evangelical community is in an uproar saying, this man's telling people to go to a wedding and he was wrong for saying so. And I I made a video explaining to people why you should not be going to weddings. You should read the comments. Oh, oh, just like the Pharisees. Oh, judge not. He without sin cast the first stone. For God hath not called us unto going to gay weddings. God hath not called us to go to the wedding of your cousin. God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. A lot of people used to preach on that till they had a grandchild do that. 
I want to tell you right now, none of that stuff pleases God. God ain't in within a million miles of that. I mean, go with me to Ephesians 5. I want to let you parents know what I'm teaching your kids. I'm trying everything I can in my, in, my, in my energy that I have that God's given me to try to make little Pharisees out of all your teenagers. With all this lasciviousness going on, I think somebody needs to say, oh, I ain't doing that. Mm-mm. I'm not one of those people. Look in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 7. I want you to see this is what we talked about this morning in Sunday school class. The Bible says, be not ye therefore partakers with them. That's talking about, that's talking about this wicked old world system. That's talking about the dirty joke teenagers at Culver's and the dirty joke teenagers at the job and, and, the, and the fornicating teenagers and the, and the pot smoking teenagers and the, and the acid trip doing teenagers. Be not partakers with them. Don't try to be hip and cool to, the, to that crowd. You stay away from them because that's wickedness and you're not called to that kind of stuff because it doesn't please God at all. Look what it says in verse number 8. It says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And, and, and I just said, look, guys, the Bible says you are light in the Lord. Walk as a child of light. If you are a born-again person, then start acting like one. If you are a born-again person, start dressing like one. If you are a born-again Christian, start having media habits that look like one. You'd be surprised what we would find in people's computers and phones and CD players. That, and some of them have the nerve to crawl up in a choir every week. Listen to Kenny Chesney all week and then they get up and do this in the choir. You ought to get right with God. What's wrong with you? Are you a Christian or no? Are you a Christian? Then start acting like one. And that's what I'm teaching your Sunday school class. Look what it says in verse number 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto what? The Lord. The problem is, is that there's people out there trying to be hip and cool in a culture and trying to be relevant inside of a culture that God is not pleased with and the ultimate standard of right and wrong in your life is not, is it comfortable? It's not if it makes me feel good. It's not if I like it. It's, is it acceptable unto the Lord? And this is, this is where the rubber meets the road for all Christian people because Christian folks are just doing like the book of Judges, just doing whatever is right in their own eyes. They're just doing whatever they want to do. And they just say, their, their excuse for everything is, but I like it. But God is not working in you to, do of, do, uh, to work and to, will and to do of his good pleasure. Then you're not spiritual. And that's what we're talking about. Verse number 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather re- reprove them. Boy. There's a lot there. If you want to please God, you need to get away from sin. Through the years, there have been some people that I've called them, or they've texted me, or they've something, and I've told them, um, I don't think you and I need to be friends anymore. I can't, I can't be a friend with you if you're going to talk like that. I can't, I can't be your friend if you're going to act like that. I remember when I first got saved and got into church got right with God, I remember it was a Wednesday night, and a bunch of my, my, my old buddies, my regular friends that I've been hanging around with for a long time, I mean, I mean talking about, I'm talking about friends that were my best friends since fifth grade, called me and said, hey, we're going up here to this restaurant. Why don't you come up there with us? And it was like, you know, 6.30, and I said, I can't go, guys. I'm going up to church tonight. And, and we had a long talk. You're going to church, but, but, but we got coupons. I said, I don't care what kind of coupon. I don't care if it's free, every, free chicken wing. No, I don't care what. And I like chicken wings. Um, um, I don't care what it is. I don't, I, I don't care. I'm going to church. It's Wednesday night. And they laughed at me. And they made fun of me. And I got mad at them. And I hung up the phone. I never, there was four people in that phone call, three of them I never spoke to ever again. You may say, well, that was awful divisive. Why didn't you just try to love them and show them the love of Christ so that they could come and receive the Lord Jesus? And, and you, know, you can throw all that beta male evangelical stuff at me if you want to. But I'm convinced with all of my heart, mind, and soul that what I did that night would please God. God was happy with me. They weren't happy with me, but, that, but God was happy with me that night. I know he was. Second Timothy chapter 2, you, you, you still with me? All right, we might hit 8 o'clock. Number four thing that you can do to please God 
is to get involved in God's work. Get involved in God's work. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may, what's that next word? Please, Please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The problem with the modern church today is that the modern church somehow, somewhere along the way through, through decades long subversion, through men like Billy Graham and, and all these other wiggly soft preachers that were out there, somewhere along the way the church of Jesus Christ has morphed from a battleship to a cruise boat. I think now we've become the love boat. Where everybody's just all about, ooh, makes me feel good, ooey gooey. And whoever, and whoever, whoever comes along, even, even, even some that uh, live in Lebanon Junction, Kentucky, that call themselves independent fundamental Baptists, that get up and preach these ooey gooey, ooey 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 stuff with this ooey gooey, ooey gooey music and these ooey gooey, ooey gooey messages can get up and draw a crowd. You know what they do? They draw the most carnal, most weak, most out of control people in the entire community and I see their Facebook pages I mean you, you go through all about Shepherdsville what's a good church in town and it's all them people and you go look at their Facebook pages and 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 they're all dressed like harlots singing in the choir but they're dressed like harlots on Facebook dressed like a harlot on Facebook but they're singing in the choir wickedness is what that is I don't care I came here preaching that, I'll leave here preaching that. Because it's in the book. Cigarettes in their mouth. We got a good church. Come on, come see us. Budweiser in their hand. Come see our church down at Lebanon Junction. Our pastor's young and he's cute. He's, we'd love to have you. Come on down. That's wickedness. What that is. Is everybody all right? It's all about pleasing God. And if we're going to be right with God, we need to quit messing around with this old world system and we need to get involved in God's work. And the Bible says, 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And I want to tell you, the church has morphed from a battleship onto a cruise boat. And the, and the, and the cruise boats that are out there today that have the most bells and whistles and have the most toys and the most water slides, those are the ones that get the most business. And it's the same thing in the church of Jesus Christ today those who have the greatest youth ministries and have the most toys on property and, and playgrounds and all these wonderful bells and whistles in a church that's where everybody goes and nobody cares about truth anymore nobody cares about this world dying and going to hell anymore nobody cares about doctrine and nobody cares about the gospel and it's all about the bells and whistles and look I'm going to tell you the church needs to quit being a cruise boat and start being a battleship again Amen. all hands on deck I've, I've, I remember growing up going to South Carolina, I think it was Charleston, South Carolina, and all them battleships down there, and we'd walk on those. And I'm going to tell you something, you can't just dress however you want to and be a soldier on a battleship. You can't just act any way you want to and be a soldier on a battleship. You can't just be any way you want to be and, and be a soldier in that army. You've got to meet the standard. And look, I'm going to tell you right now, it's a war. Do you understand that? It's a war. And we've got to get involved in this battle because that's what pleases God. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4. We'll land the plane. Bill ran it and raved this morning. I thought I'd do the same. You need to stop viewing yourself as a member of a church, as some sort of customer, that the leadership is here to please you. You need to start viewing yourself as a soldier, ready to take orders. That's how you need to view yourself. Get involved in God's work. But last verse, Philippians chapter 4. The, four, the fifth thing you can do, the last thing you could do that I'm going to give you tonight that will please God is to give to the work of God. Lewis says there, and uh, Paul's writing to this church, this is a prayer letter to a church, verse number 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. That's, that, I preached on that many times in missions. Giving to the work of God is, is not, you know, it's not like, a, some, some people act like tithing is a form of extortion or something like that. Uh, it's not. When you give to the work of God, 
you're investing in the work of God, and when people go out and win souls, you get a reward for that. You know that, right? The Bible says in verse number 18, for, But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. That, that giving, man, giving pleases God. There was a story years ago where a, a little boy while his daddy was at work, was, uh, was built a big, you know, took cardboard boxes and built himself a big building inside the house in the living room. And when he, daddy came home, he saw this building and he says, uh, Daddy, I want you to come over here and play store with me. And he says, is this your store? And he goes, yeah, th Daddy, this is my store. And he said, Daddy, I want you to come buy something from my store. And, uh, and the little boy, you know, the daddy went over there and said, okay, I'll take that toy right there. And uh, the little boy picked up the toy, sat right there and said, Daddy, that'll be, that'll be $100. And Daddy reached in his pocket and just got off work and pulled out two pennies and put those pennies down and said, there you go, I'll take that right there. And the little boy slammed his hand on those pennies and said, Daddy, I said we're playing store. We're not playing church. We're playing store. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something right there, man, boy, that's how it works sometimes. <sighs> I want to please God with my life. You ought to get saved if you're not saved. You ought to learn to give the gospel. Everybody you know ought to, ought to know that you're saved. You ought to get away from sin. You ought to get involved in God's work. And lastly, you ought to be given to God's work. Those are just five things that you can do to please God. I hope that you desire to do that with your life. I'm going to ask somebody to come play this piano. I'm going to pray, and then we'll give an invitation. Really, life is not about pleasing yourself. It's about pleasing God. And I found the secret out. Y'all want to hear it? The secret is... That if you live to make God happy, God will make you happy. Does that make sense? If you live to make God happy and say, I want, to be, I want the Lord to be pleased with me in this area of my life. If you live to please God, God, you'll find a pleasure in that that you won't find in anything else. If you live to make God happy, God will make you happy. Father, bless this time. Speak to our hearts. Help us to be right with you. Help us to choose to please you in all things. We'll give you glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name.